Dragon Spirit The New Legend is one of the most exciting vertical shoot 'em up games for the NES. Like many other games from this era, Dragon Spirit was originally an arcade game, and this one was developed by Namco. Namco was one of the most famous Japanese arcade developers, and they made some of the most iconic video games of all time, including Galaga, Galaxian, and Pac-Man. Although nowhere near as popular as Pac-Man, Namco had a big hit in 1982 with a game called Xevious. Xevious is one of the earliest auto-scrolling vertical shoot-'em-up games and is one of the most influential in the genre. The gameplay is fairly simple, but with one interesting wrinkle. You have two forms of attack. Your standard zapper shots are used to clear flying enemies, but you have to drop bombs to destroy targets on the ground. Five years later, in 1987, Namco released Dragon Spirit in the arcade. And although the graphics are more advanced, this game follows the template established by Xevious. Your character is a fire-breathing dragon instead of a spaceship, and you'll find all sorts of power-ups to upgrade your dragon, including ones that will allow you to grow up to three heads for triple the firepower. Your breath attack will roast flying enemies, and you'll drop bombs on monsters that attack from below. The game has nine stages, each ending with an epic boss battle against a large monster. The arcade game was popular, so of course it was ported to a number of home systems. The NES version was developed by a Japanese studio called Now Production, a studio whose name might not sound familiar because they typically did contract work for other companies, but you would probably recognize a lot of the games they made, including Jackie Chan's Action Kung Fu, Yo Noid, and Adventure Islands 2 and 3. For the NES version of Dragon Spirit, Now Production decided not to try to exactly replicate what you'd see in the arcade, and instead redesigned the game from the ground up with a home console experience in mind. They positioned their NES game as a sequel to the arcade original, calling it Dragon Spirit, The New Legend. The New Legend includes a lot more story elements and begins with a prologue level where the player battles an easy version of Zawell, the arcade game's final boss. Failing this battle unlocks the Gold Dragon, which is the game's easy mode. Unfortunately, as Gold Dragon, you won't get to play all of the levels or fight the true final boss, but it is nice that the developers included an easier mode players could use for practice. The normal Blue Dragon mode has nine levels, featuring enemies and settings from the arcade original. Most of the memorable parts of the arcade game are here, and these levels play like remixed versions of the ones in the arcade. The developers even added an all-new final boss battle to finish the story. The music was composed by Masakatsu Meikawa, credited as Kiyoshi. His soundtrack takes good advantage of the NES hardware, creating music that seamlessly integrates with the setting and you'll find yourself humming along with it as you lay waste to the monsters in your path. Meikawa did a lot of work for Now Production, and also composed music for Jackie Chan's Action Kung Fu and Adventure Island 3. The game was published by Bandai in North America, and in 2006 they would merge with original publisher Namco to become Bandai Namco Entertainment. Dragon Spirit The New Legend was not extremely popular when it released in North America in June of 1990, and I wonder how many people saw the box art and thought this was an RPG. Still, for players that liked arcade-style shoot-'em-ups, this game delivered on its promise of exciting action, beautiful graphics, and a great 8-bit soundtrack. If you'd like to play Dragon Spirit The New Legend on a modern platform, 
It is available as part of the Namco Museum Archives collection for PlayStation 4, Xbox, Nintendo Switch, and Steam. Modern players that attempt this game will still have to deal with all of the challenges the NES is notorious for. The action is fast and furious, sometimes with tons of projectiles on screen. Your dragon can survive a couple hits before dying, but each time you take damage, you'll lose a level of firepower and one of your heads. If you run out of lives, you get two continues, but after that, it'll be game over. But what if I told you the best way to survive all nine treacherous levels? What if I told you the secret for getting each of the six maiden bonuses at the end of the early stages? And what if I showed you the best way to defeat every boss? Even Golda himself? Well, on today's episode of You Can Beat Video Games, we'll learn all of that and more. If you're new to the channel, we're doing deep dives on retro video games and giving you the professional strategies that can be used by the casual gamer. Please make sure to subscribe and check out YouCanBeatVideoGames.com for episode lists, news, and official You Can Beat Video Games merchandise. And also join our exclusive Discord community on Patreon. Let's get started. All right. Dragon Spirit, the new legend. Before we get started, if you'd like to access the game's sound test, on controller 2, hold A, B, and up as you reset the game, and you'll reload onto this screen. Once you're in the sound test, still on controller 2, press B, up, up, B, down, down, B, and another number will appear under the sound test. That is the stage select, and using controller 1, press right and left to change that number, and then press start to begin on any of the game's nine stages. So that's a great way to practice some of the more difficult stages in the game. If you'd like to begin with 20 lives, after the prologue, as you press start, hold down A and B on controller 2, and keep them held down until this cutscene finishes, and you'll see that you've begun the game with 20 lives. 20 lives will definitely help, but this game can be difficult even with 100 lives, so if you need some practice, you may want to start out by playing as the Gold Dragon. And there's no options menu in this game. If you want to be the Gold Dragon, you have to die here in the prologue level. It seems that the hero Amru has disguised himself as a blue dragon, but I don't think too many other people can transform into dragons, so I don't think that Zawell is going to be fooled. In any case, if you let yourself die here, you'll be able to become the Gold Dragon, and first we'll see this cutscene, which has been censored for the North American version. You can see what the Japanese version looks like on the left. Someone decided to put a shirt on that guy. I'm not sure who thought that was necessary, but whoever it was, I hope they've never played Pro Wrestling or Mike Tyson's Punch-Out, because those games must be downright scandalous. Censorship aside, it's time to pick up the sword and transform into the Gold Dragon. And I'm not going to spend a ton of time on the Gold Dragon mode since it is a lot easier, but I did want to touch on it for just a moment. You'll see right away when we start up the game that you have two life bars in the lower left corner instead of just one, and if you just hold down the fire button, you have rapid fire automatically built in without any power-ups. So that's definitely going to make the game a lot easier. The problem, of course, with the gold dragon is that you don't get to play all of the levels, and you'll see that after we finish the first stage. You will always get the Maiden at the end of each stage, and those Maidens will have different messages for the Gold Dragon. 
I'm going to show those as we play the blue dragon mode, so you won't miss out on that bit of the story. After this cutscene, you'll see that we're going to go directly to Area 3, skipping over Area 2. As the Gold Dragon, you'll also skip Areas 5, 6, and 8, and whenever you get to Area 9, it is much shorter and easier than the Area 9 you would play as the Blue Dragon. At the end of that Area 9, you'll face the final boss, but you'll only face the first form of the boss as the Gold Dragon. And this boss is super easy, you just have to get right in front of it if you're powered up, and just unload on Golda as soon as he opens his arms. As the Gold Dragon, we're going to get a different ending, and this ending is considered the bad ending, but it's not really bad, it's just different. It seems that the whole thing was just a dream, and that makes a lot of sense considering that in the previous cutscene, we were in bed. I'm scared of the dark, but my sister Iris is the scariest. And well, I guess that wraps things up here for The Legend of Dragon. The end? Yeah, okay, that's pretty strange. Let's try the game as the blue dragon, and we'll start back here at the prologue. This prologue level is pretty easy, but if you do happen to die unintentionally and you wanted to play the game as the blue dragon, you're going to have to reset. Just try to kill all of the flashing enemies, some of them need to be taken out with your bombs, and you should get a ton of power-ups, which is going to make the boss very easy. When you get to the end of the stage, stay in the upper left corner until the boss appears, and then float down to the middle. This will keep the boss from going all the way to the bottom of the screen, and as soon as he moves the rod, just rapidly shoot at Zawell, and he will easily be defeated. This time, instead of censored beefcake, we get a little bit of a family history lesson about some of the characters in this game. Amru and Arisha had twins named Lace and Iris. Meanwhile, someone named Golda just kind of casually started conquering the Earth, as Goldas do. Golda kidnapped Iris, but that was a big mistake. Lace took the sword which his father left, and with it, transformed into the Blue Dragon. And this is where the game truly begins. If you've found any power-ups or scored any points in the prologue, none of that actually counts. Area 1 is called the Paleozoic Era, and based on that name, you'd think that we might be doing some time traveling, but actually the entire game takes place in the Paleozoic Era. You'll find some flashing enemies at the very beginning of the stage, which will help you get some early power-ups, and you just want to avoid the fireballs. You can't actually destroy those, so stay in the lower part of the screen whenever you see those coming. That will give you a lot of time to get out of their way. As we fly over the water here, we're attacked by a squadron of sauropods, and you'll need to take them out using your ground bomb attacks. If you don't kill them quickly, they'll spit three projectiles which spread in a wide pattern, so you certainly don't want too many of them on the screen at once. As you're flying along, look for blue and red eggs on the ground. You need to hit them with your ground bomb attack for them to hatch, but the blue ones will always give you a power up that gives you an additional head, and the red ones will give you the standard firepower upgrade. On the snow below, you'll see some pink enemies that will jump up and attack you from the air. These guys can be taken out while they're still on the ground using your bombs, but the bombs have short range, so you may be better off just staying at the bottom of the screen and aim to shoot these guys as soon as they jump. They make a little move on the ground before they jump, so it's easy to tell when it's about to happen. These pink birds explode in a shower of feathers whenever you hit them, so make sure you're far away when you're targeting those guys. The third one dropped a dual dragon's power up, and that makes you have a smaller hitbox, which is nice, and it also creates two smaller dragons on the left and the right, 
giving you triple firepower. The downside is you lose any heads you had before you got the power up, so if we take a hit, we'll turn back into a normal single head dragon without the ones on the side, and if we find a head power up, we'll become a normal two headed dragon. Now we just found the earthquake bombs, so for a short time, any enemies on the ground that are on screen whenever we drop our bombs will be defeated. So that's a nice power up, but you won't find it very often, and it does not last very long. When you see the second set of pink birds, you're almost to the end of the stage. Watch out for a fireball that's coming down the middle, but once it passes, you want to move into the center here, so that you'll avoid the next two sets of fireballs, and you'll also be able to shoot that flashing enemy, which drops an extra life. So make sure to collect that, then watch out for a set of fireballs on the left, then another one on the right. And here's the boss, the Plesiosaurus. If you get here with a bunch of power-ups, this boss is almost too easy. But what if you have to fight this guy with an underpowered dragon? Well, in that case, you might need a bit more strategy. The boss's weak point is its head, and to be safe, only shoot at the boss when it's moving towards you, not when it's moving away from you. It will keep moving in one direction until it hits one of the edges of the screen or gets about three quarters of the way down, and try to avoid going behind the boss because it will launch a bunch of fireballs from its shell. Even if you don't have a lot of power-ups, if you follow those strategies, you should have no problem defeating the Plesiosaurus. And then it's time to meet the first maiden. There's no trick to this one. You always get the first maiden. However, you don't get anything from her, so I guess nothing ventured, nothing gained. She says that her friends are also prisoners, and they will be helpful if they turn up. It's only Area 2, but we're already turning up the heat. It's time for the Volcano. Start out this stage in the lower corners so that you can quickly clear out lines of phoenixes as they fly on screen. Many of them will be flashing, so this is a good opportunity to get easy power-ups, and we even found a green dragon upgrade, which gives us the game's highest level of firepower. Now, we just replaced that with the white dragon upgrade, and this is not as powerful as the green dragon, but it offers a wider angle of fire, and it lets you shoot more streams of flame. While I'd say the green dragon is better, the white dragon is still pretty good. In this area, small volcanoes erupt, and at the top of the lava, a phoenix emerges. Stay at the bottom of the screen here, look for the eruptions, and shoot those birds as soon as they appear on screen. Stay in the lower corners here to take out another couple lines of phoenixes, and we got our green dragon upgrade back. Nice! When you see these large flaming balls, stay in the center of the screen, and as soon as they start moving towards you, move in an L-shaped pattern to avoid them. The other thing you can do is shoot the ball in the middle, and then move to the top of the screen. That will also work. As we cross this large sea of lava, phoenixes dart out from below. You can avoid most of them by just flying up to the top of the screen where your score is, but make sure to move down a bit whenever you cross that landmass to collect the power-ups. And as soon as that landmass drifts off the bottom of the screen, you'll face two more sets of the flaming balls, and once the background turns to a solid red, it'll be time to fight the Magma Phoenix. This boss always starts out in the middle and moves to the left, so if you have a powered up dragon, just follow along with it, staying close and rapidly shooting. Now, if you're working with a weaker dragon, I'll start out by showing that alternate strategy for the fireballs. Just shoot out the middle one, move to the top, and then go back to the center. And here's what to do with a weaker dragon against the Magma Phoenix. You're going to start out the same way, staying between the two rows of orbs, and just following along with the bird. Whenever it stops moving, get away from it. The boss will split into an array of smaller birds that will be very hard to avoid if you're close to it, 
but they won't damage you when they come back onto the screen, so as soon as you see where the boss is reappearing, you can get right up next to it and resume your attack. So you can see one of the birds flew right through my dragon that time. And with a little bit of effort, you should have no problem defeating the Magma Phoenix. And that brings us to a cutscene with the Fire Maiden. The Fire Maiden only appears when you do not have the highest levels of firepower. So if you have the green dragon, or if your blue dragon spits the big fireballs, instead you'll just get a shadow. And the shadow has a different message for us, but you won't get the benefit from the Maiden, which is that she would restore your health. In this game, the only way other than a Maiden to refill your health is to die, so you'll want to take advantage of those opportunities when you can. And that brings us to Area 3, The Jungle. There's a head power up at the very beginning, and after you collect it, you just want to drift down here to the lower left corner, where you'll be able to avoid most of these enemies, but whenever you see one stop and open up, you just want to slide out and shoot it. Most of the time the projectiles it fires would miss you anyway, but you don't want to take too many chances. That flashing frog not only has a power up for you, but if you don't bomb those frogs quickly enough, they'll launch five projectiles onto the screen, and that can be quite a lot with all the dragonflies that are flying around as well. So keep your eyes open for those frogs and try to bomb them as soon as they appear, if you can't bomb them right away, try to get behind them because they always shoot their projectiles down screen. We've managed to find the Green Dragon upgrade again, which should make this area a lot easier, assuming we can manage to not get hit by an enemy, which would cause us to lose it. Oh, and now we have three heads as well. That is very good. In this area, you want to stay low on the screen. You're going to be attacked by all sorts of insects, and you also need to clear out these green vines that appear in the middle. If you stay at the bottom, these butterflies will wait at the top of the screen until several of them have clustered together, and then they'll all start flying towards you. Once you see them move in your direction, all you need to do is move straight up the screen to the top, and they will harmlessly fly out below you. Past the butterflies will encounter these brightly colored birds, and they're very similar to the pink birds that we fought in Area 1, except these ones will shoot feathers straight down at you if you don't kill them quickly enough. Over here, we're going to encounter another enemy type. These are known as honeycombs, and I actually like the wide angle of the white dragon for these guys. You can get right in the middle and just keep shooting and the wider shots will take out the spheres that are released from the left and the right. If you have a high level of power, these honeycombs aren't too bad, but if you're a weaker dragon, you should focus on the spheres that they release and don't worry about killing the honeycomb itself. If you have the green dragon, a fully powered up blue dragon, the white dragon, or even the pink dragon, you can get right up on these things and keep shooting them, and this strategy will work just fine. I think this is the last one, but you'll know you've reached the end of the honeycombs when you start seeing the sparse grasses pop up again in the background. So you're just looking for some grass to appear, and you'll know you're in the clear, and there it is. There's another flashing enemy for a last minute power up before the boss. The boss here is going to be one that we'll use our bombs on, and we just found an invincibility power-up, so that's going to make this last stretch very easy. And as the last enemy drops off the screen, and the large roots come into view, you'll know that it's time to fight the boss, and this one is called Griathrius. If you have multiple heads, you should be able to position your dragon so that you can take out the two pods in the front at the same time. To defeat this boss, you need to get rid of all four of those flashing pods using your bombs, but you'll also need to use your air attack occasionally to clear out some of the seeds that the boss shoots at you, otherwise they'll hit your dragon. The boss releases the seeds in waves, 
so between each wave you should have a moment to drop your bombs. Once you clear out the first four flashing pods, four more pop up, but this time they're spread out in a different way, so you won't be able to remove two at the same time. You'll need to take out each one of these individually, and when you clear out the fourth pod this time, the boss's true weak point will emerge. It's a pink flower in the middle. You'll have to get kinda close to it and drop bombs on the flower, and you'll also need to keep using your air attack to clear out those seeds that it continues to spew at you. Now that of course is what you do if you had a fully powered up dragon, and you may think that because we were mostly attacking this boss with our bombs, that having a lower powered dragon wouldn't be that big of a deal, but that is not the case at all. This is by far one of the most difficult bosses in the game to beat with an underpowered dragon, and there's a good reason for that. With the weakest level of firepower, it takes multiple shots to clear those seeds that the boss spews at you, and if some of those seeds are stacked on top of each other, that could be a big problem for your dragon. You want to try to stay low on the screen so that you have more time to clear out those seeds, but you'll need to go high up on the screen to take out the two pods in the upper left and the upper right, so those are the most difficult ones to hit. You may need to move in and drop bombs as the boss is launching a wave of seeds, and then drop down on the screen as they fall to try to avoid them. Once you get to the middle, it certainly doesn't get easier. You'll continue to have to avoid the seeds while trying to drop bombs on the boss, and you want to try to navigate around those seeds when possible. You'll notice that there aren't that many in the middle, so you should be able to find a hole to weave into if you're looking hard enough. Once we cut down this giant tree, we'll meet the Flower Maiden, and unfortunately there's no real trick to this one, it's pure luck. You have a 50% chance of getting the Flower Maiden, and if she does show up, she'll give you an extra life, so that is very lucky. If you're playing as the Gold Dragon, the Flower Maiden will have some more interesting information for you. She tells you a bit about Galda, who is the final boss. If you're not lucky enough to see the Flower Maiden, you'll instead meet with her shadow. The shadow has a sad message for us. The forest was once peaceful, but now the plants and birds are gone. Only you can restore the beauty and peace again. And that brings us to Area 4, The Graveyard. Flashing enemies will start flying in from both sides, so you want to stay in the lower middle to try to collect all the power-ups that they drop. In this area, you need to watch out for these rock tosser enemies. They'll come in from the bottom of the screen, and if you don't bomb them quickly, they'll throw rocks at you, so either take them out fast or get away from them. And we got an invincibility power-up, which will make this area a bit easier and we're going to avoid that dual dragons because we already have three heads, and essentially it would be a downgrade. Taking out that flashing enemy on the right gave us an extra life, and watch out for skull power-ups which are going to start appearing. If you collect one of those, it will reduce your firepower and take away one of your heads. So while some of the power-ups in this game are situationally bad, the skull is pretty much always bad. There are a lot of ground-based enemies here in the graveyard, so you'll definitely want to take those out with your bombs, otherwise you'll be dealing with a lot of projectiles on screen. When you come to this next section, you'll see a lot of darkness below, and out of that darkness, ghosts will emerge. If you stay about mid-level on the screen and keep shooting, the specters will just jump right into your shots. If you don't have a higher level of firepower, they might still jump through your shots and into your dragon, so you may need to maneuver around them if you have a lower power. And over here, we're very close to the end, but before we get to the boss, these green spiders will appear, and you just want to be on either the left or the right side when they pop up, and just strafe across the screen to clear them. 
and once you get rid of three waves of spiders, it'll be time to face the Death Guardian. The glowing orb at its center is the weak point of the Death Guardian, and like most bosses in this game, if you have a powered up dragon, you should be able to defeat it easily. However, if you're using a weak dragon, it's going to be a bit harder. The key to defeating this boss is to only shoot it when it's moving towards you, and only shoot it when it's in the upper half of the screen, because whenever it breaks apart, you don't want it to be in the lower part of the screen, because then the ghosts that come out can get you. If it's in the upper half of the screen, the blue ghosts won't be able to reach you, and you'll only need to dodge the pink pieces of the boss that come flying out, and then you can focus on shooting the orb some more. Just like the Phoenix boss, you do not need to dodge the pieces of the boss when they come back onto the screen, only when they go flying off. So right now we can focus on shooting the orb, and when those pink pieces of the boss come flying back onto the screen, we can focus on shooting the orb, but only when the boss is moving towards us, so that we don't get hit by those tongues of flame that it spits out. And whenever the orb is just floating around on the screen, that's a good time to get some free hits on it. But you can see, as long as we're only shooting it when it's in the upper part of the screen and when it's moving towards us, we'll be mostly safe. The fourth maiden is the Flower Fairy, and she will appear if you have two or fewer heads. Just like the Fire Maiden, the Flower Fairy will restore your health. Now, if you're playing as the Gold Dragon, you will play through Area 4, so you'll get the Flower Fairy at the end, and she tells us a little bit more about Galda, and then asks us to slay Galda to change the people back to their true forms. Strangely enough, if you get the shadow form of the Flower Fairy because you were playing on Blue Dragon mode and had all three of your heads, she has the exact same message that she had in the Gold Dragon mode. So a little bit of overlap there. Whether you found the real Flower Fairy or her shadow, that brings us to Area 5, Cave Road, and this one is tough. The sides of the stage move in and out, and if you bump into them, you'll take damage. There's also some posts that keep popping up in the middle of the area, which makes the whole thing even more claustrophobic. Even more annoying are the enemies that get so close to the walls that you won't be able to remove them, but they can definitely take shots at you, and that happens a lot with the spiders that appear on webs. You might think that these rolling pill bugs would also be very annoying, but enemies that you have to remove using bombs are actually easier to deal with in these tight spaces. While your air attack can be blocked by the walls, your bombs actually go right over them. In this area, it gets even tighter, so you'll want to stay low on the screen so that you can shoot any enemies that come in, and you'll notice that your dragon's hitbox is a little bit smaller than it appears. You can actually touch the sides with the edges of your wings and you won't get damaged. If anything touches the head or middle of your dragon, those hits will definitely count, so be careful. And over here, we'll encounter some jumping frogs. These frogs start out as very small green circles, which you can hit with your bombs, but as soon as they jump up into the air, you'll be able to hit them with your air attack. But if you don't hit them fast enough, they will release a ton of projectiles, so make sure to clear them quickly either way. If you thought it was tight before, it gets even tighter up here, so avoid the edges like you're playing Operation, stay low on the screen, and keep moving along with the background so you don't get hit. Luckily, it's not going to get any tighter than this. Once you see the second set of green frog enemies, we're almost to the end. Just watch out for the posts that block the mouth of the cave, and you'll be able to slide out and finally have some room to breathe. Up here, a few more bats attack before the boss, but once you see the large web, you'll know it's time to fight the Spider Queen. 
The Spider Queen always starts out in the middle of the web, so get ready to bomb her on the abdomen as soon as she comes within range. Whenever the Queen jumps, you can hit her with your air attack, and if your dragon's powered up, she will not last long. The low power strategy for this boss starts out the same way, but you need to survive for much longer, so we're going to have to do something about these additional spiders that spawn. You want to focus most of your attacks on the queen herself, but any of the spiders that appear in the lower part of the web are going to be in the way, and you're going to need to clear them out. There can only be five additional spiders on screen at once, so if most of them are on the upper part of the screen, they'll be a lot easier to avoid. And that brings us to our fifth maiden. This one has a strange horn in the middle of her head, and she appears at random just like the flower maiden did. Just like the flower maiden, she has a 50% chance of appearing, and if she does, she gives you a one-up. Otherwise, you'll just get this message from her shadow, and then it will be time to move on to Glacier Land. At first glance, you might think that Glacier Land is very similar to the first area, but it won't be long before you realize how different these areas are. At the beginning, a bunch of flying enemies will swoop in and shower you with projectiles. Try to take out as many of them as you can. A lot of those enemies are flashing and will drop power-ups when defeated. We just were able to collect an invincibility power-up, which will make the beginning of this part easy. We need to use our bombs to remove these walrus enemies, and they will shoot you constantly if you don't kill them fast. You'll encounter some snow drifts that block your way in these narrow corridors, and you'll need to shoot through them using your air attack. Watch out for enemies that attack from below, though. You may need to switch to your bombs occasionally. As you clear the snow drifts, you'll find some power-ups that are frozen within them, although occasionally they'll be the bad power-ups like the skull, so be careful that you don't pick up any of those. After dealing with the extremely narrow spaces in Cave Road, this doesn't seem so bad, but we're still moving at the normal speed. When we get to the next narrow section in this area, we're going to be moving much faster, and that's going to make things a little bit more difficult. When you emerge in this wide open space, use this opportunity to grab a couple power-ups, and then buckle up, because here's the fast speed part. It may not look that much faster, but when you're playing the game and you're used to the normal slow speed, this feels very fast. If you have an invincibility power-up like we do now, you can fly right through the snow drifts, so you don't have to worry about shooting them. And whenever you come to a fork, there is a dead end on the left right there, so when in doubt, go to the right. That was the one and only dead end, so as long as you avoid that one, you just need to shoot your way through the snow drifts and the rocks that get in your way, navigate the narrow passages, and eventually you'll come to the end where you'll emerge near a body of water, and that's where we're going to fight the boss, Gubria. If you're fully powered up, waiting over here on the right side will cause Gubria to fly off screen and come right back down in the middle, where you can be waiting to quickly finish him off. Now, if you don't have a fully powered up dragon, there is another strategy that you can use. There's actually a safe spot over here on the far right side of the screen next to this icy island, so you can just hang out over here and rapidly mash the attack button, but you want to watch and see if Gubria gets down to his last five sections, because when he gets too small, you do need to move out of this position. So right now, once he's too small, you just want to start leading him across the screen, shooting him when he's slightly behind your dragon. Stay at the bottom so that you can more easily avoid his attacks, and just keep blasting the head until it explodes. Once Gubria is defeated, we'll meet the game's final maiden. This one, known as the Mermaiden, only appears if you have two or fewer heads, and she'll refill your health. 
remember that the only other way to refill your health is to die. So if you need to take a hit at the end of that boss battle so that you can get refilled right here, you may want to do that. If you have three heads, you'll see our final shadow message. This one tells us that Golda is under the iceberg and we should do our very best. That brings us to Area 7, the Deep Sea, and you might think that our dragon wouldn't be very effective under the water, but surprise, he works the exact same way. Unlike the previous two stages that featured a lot of narrow spaces, this one is wide open and you don't have to worry about bumping into the sides. We just found the earthquake bombs, so that'll make clearing the ground enemies easier for a few moments. And there's another power-up you can find that looks like a red circle with an X on it. That one makes earthquakes happen even when you're not dropping bombs, so it's even better. Over here on the right side, you'll see a flashing scallop enemy. And whenever you kill it, it'll drop a 1-up, so don't miss that. You're going to need every life you can get for the last few areas. In the next part of this area, we're going to meet a very dangerous enemy type, the Shell Shooters. These guys mount themselves to a spiky green shell, and they will just launch projectiles at you, which you can clear with your air attack. So whenever these things appear on the screen, you just want to get rid of them very quickly so that they don't catch you from behind. However, you're going to come across a couple that are positioned in such a way that you can't actually shoot them because they're mounted to the top of a spiky shell. And here they are right there. Your best bet with these two is to stay below their level until they scroll all the way off the screen. Then you can resume dealing with the other enemies. Luckily, those are the only two that appear that way. So you'll be able to shoot the rest of them and there's only a few more left at this point. So take out the last few up here, watching out for enemies that drop bad power-ups, and once you get past this last spiky shell, we'll be on to the next section. In here you'll see these green lizard enemies. You want to wait about a third of the way up the screen until they float up there and then just slide down to the bottom to avoid them. And in this area, you're going to see some sea dragons that pop out of a hole. Be on the lookout for those sea dragon holes, and whenever you see the dragon pop out, immediately shoot it in the face. Once you can get behind the sea dragon, it won't be able to hit you, but if you don't take them out fast, they will shoot a stream of purple fireballs that will wreck your dragon. The boss of Area 7 is the Sea Devil, and if you're a powered up dragon, you just want to position yourself slightly to the right of center on the boss, and keep shooting it as you move along with it to the right. If you're an underpowered dragon, this boss is much, much harder. The Sea Devil moves back and forth, but it always stays on the same horizontal plane. It can only be damaged when the mouth opens, and it will open its mouth to shoot a wave of projectiles at you, or to release a small fish which will orbit the boss and will also drop projectiles on you. If you don't remove the smaller fish fast enough, they'll come swimming towards you, so stay at the bottom of the screen, do your best to weave between the projectiles, and just keep shooting at the boss until it explodes. There's no cutscene and no maiden this time. We're just on to Area 8, the Dark Quarters. In the arcade, this area is completely dark and your dragon carries a flashlight which illuminates the space in front of it. Here on the NES, the lights fade in and out, so sometimes it's completely dark, but other times you can see perfectly. Try to make note of where the enemies are whenever the lights are on, and whenever it's dark, keep shooting. If your shots are hitting something right in front of you, it's probably a spiky ball and you need to move out of the way. You'll actually be able to see the enemies that you need to kill with your bombs whenever the lights are off, but the ones that you need to clear with your air attack will be completely invisible, so whenever it's dark, you want to be using that air attack. This Octo Eyeball is right in the middle of the stage. You can take it out with your bombs, but it's not actually that dangerous. 
don't be distracted by it and get killed by something else. The snails in this area shoot a lot of projectiles, so try to avoid those, but at least you can see them in the dark. And here in the last part of this stage are some glowing spiders which you'll need to clear using your bombs. The spiders themselves aren't the real problem here. There's a lot of spiky balls in this area, and whenever the lights go off, if you're trying to hit ground-based enemies, you might not notice some of those spiky balls and get hit. The lights fade down one more time, and when they come back up, it's time to fight the boss, the wall face. There's a spot that's safe from the tongue attack in the lower left corner. You are not safe from the tongue in the lower right. It's going to do two tongue attacks, and then the eyes will light up and start shooting beams at you. You can only damage the eyes when they're flashing, and the tongue can actually block your shots, so you want to lure the tongue off to the side so that you can hit the eyes behind it. With a lower powered dragon, I don't like to use the safe spot as much, and instead, on the sides of the path, there's a thick black line, and you can line your dragon's head up with it, and it will put you in the exact position where you need to be to hit those eyeballs. Those eyes are a small target, and with a lower power dragon, they're a little bit harder to hit. So just wait here near the path. On the second tongue movement, you're going to move over onto the other line. So wait here, second tongue, move over to the line, and then don't stay in one spot for too long, or you'll get hit by one of the eye's lightning bolts or the tongue itself. So you only get a quick second to make some shots whenever you have the opportunity, but it actually works pretty well. Use the sides of the path as a guide, and you should be able to defeat this boss. I always thought that the wall face was a very cool looking boss. Very neat design. Beyond the wall face is the game's final stage, Area 9, the Dark Castle. This stage is long and has a number of different sections. Here at the very beginning, we need to navigate around these spiky balls, while taking out a bunch of enemies, most of which need to be removed with your ground bombs. There are a few bats that you'll need to hit though using your air attack, and if you see a blue mask attached to the wall, you can use your air attack to kill those as well. While there are a lot of flashing enemies in this stage that you can kill for items, they drop the skull power up at a very high frequency, so you need to watch out for those. There is going to be a dead end up here on the right, but the screen is scrolling pretty slowly right now, so you should have no problem avoiding it. However, right near that dead end, we're going to find an interesting power-up. You need to bomb the torch that you see there, and sometimes it will drop an exclamation point. The exclamation point is a combination item, it gives you invincibility and shrinks your dragon, so while the shrinking part might be undesirable, the invincibility is certainly good. At the end of each part of this area, you'll find a flashing travel door that when touched will teleport you directly to the next segment. In here, there's a bunch of spears that pop out of the wall, and the corridors get very narrow. You want to wait until the spear is retracting into the wall to move past it. So wait until it's retracting and move past, and the game is going to start moving a bit faster here, but don't panic and get hit by the spears. You definitely need to get around the walls though. If you get caught in a dead end or smashed behind a wall, you'll either take a bunch of damage or just straight up die. The good news is the higher speed makes this segment a very short one, and once you get past this next corridor full of spears, you're going to find the travel door that will bring you to the next segment. This is one of the shorter sections, but this is where the ninjas first appear, and they're one of the most dangerous enemy types in the game. You can only kill the ninjas with your bombs, but if they throw a knife at you, you'll want to clear that using your air attack, otherwise those knives will follow you all around the screen. You can see here that we found the pink dragon item, 
and the pink dragon has very strong firepower, but you can only have one head as a pink dragon, and if you had more heads before you collected the power up, you'll be reduced down to one. So if you had two or more heads, you probably don't want to pick up a pink dragon power up, otherwise it could be useful. But now we have the green dragon form, and if we can hold this one all the way to the end, it would make the final boss much easier. We need to clear through some bricks in this area, so make sure that you keep shooting and watch out for dead ends. The screen is scrolling slowly though, so you should be able to get through there no problem. We're getting very close to the end now. There's more ninjas in this section and lots of flashing enemies that drop items, but many of them are going to be skulls, so make sure you dodge the skulls and only get the power-ups that you actually want. Make sure that you clear out any knives that the ninjas throw at you. The knives are a much bigger problem than the ninjas themselves. And up here, we'll come to a more narrow hallway, and inside are the statue guards. The statue guards attack you with their mace balls, which have a very far range. So don't think that just because you're at the bottom of the screen they can't reach you. However, if you can shoot the statue in the face, it will destroy the statue and the mace ball, so you won't have to worry about being hit by it. These statues take quite a few hits if you have low firepower, so you will need to dodge the mace balls a few times before you'll be able to take them out if you're not working with a more powerful dragon. And at the end you see the travel door. If you don't have a very high level of power, you may just want to try to fly up between the last two statues without killing them. This is the final segment before we start fighting bosses. In addition to the annoying jumping frog enemies, we have to deal with some spiders that are positioned on the edges of the screen where they are very difficult to hit. So you're just going to have to avoid the projectiles that they shoot at you. Try to stay low on the screen and when the projectiles come your way, move up towards the center. And when you come to this blue section, it's time to fight the first of the final three bosses. This is the Hydra, and it's possible to actually take out two of the heads at once if you position yourself in between them. With the green dragon or the highest level of blue dragon firepower, getting rid of the Hydra will take mere seconds. This path across the lava will take us to the final confrontation with Galda, but first we'll be attacked by some fireballs. Just stay in the middle of the path down at the bottom and keep shooting, and you should be able to clear any fireballs out that come your way. So we'll just stay down here, shoot through some fireballs, and up here you'll find some flashing enemies that will give you some last minute power-ups before the final bosses. Make sure not to grab any power-ups that you don't want. And here is Galda's first form. The boss always starts here in the middle, and if you're fully powered up, you can just get right in front of him, start rapidly shooting, and as soon as he spreads his arms, he will be immediately defeated. And that brings us to the final boss, the Golda Machine. With a fully powered up dragon, just wait to the left of the boss until the hands move, then get right in front of him and rapidly attack. If you have enough firepower, he'll immediately go down. Now let's bring it back to the Hydra and talk about what to do with an underpowered dragon. Against this boss, you don't want to kill any of the individual heads right away. Instead, you want to keep shooting each of them evenly, because while all three heads are on screen, they won't all three be able to shoot you at the same time, and they move more slowly. So if you evenly distribute the damage across them, once you clear one of the heads, you'll be able to clear the other two right away. So we did finish off the one on the right, and we should be able to kill these other two pretty quickly because we put a lot of damage on them, and you can see how they do move faster once you kill one or two of the other heads. Once the Hydra is out of the way, we need to fly across the lava to where the final boss is, but it's a little bit more difficult when your dragon's not powered up. These fireballs are a bit more dangerous now, so I recommend staying at the bottom of the screen, 
wait for the fireballs to start moving towards you, and then fly over to the opposite corner. Wait there until the fireballs appear again, and then fly across to the other corner. And once they're out of the way, you definitely want to take this opportunity to grab whatever power-ups you can before you fight these bosses. You'd rather not be fighting them with level 1 firepower. We're going to have to take this boss a bit more seriously this time. You can only damage him whenever he opens his arms, but you want to stay at the bottom of the screen, start shooting at the boss when he appears, get in a few shots when he opens his arms, but then you need to move to one of the corners. Go to whichever side has more space on it, because he's going to release some magic energy, and there's only a gap on the left and right corner of it. So you want to make sure that you stay in that gap so that you don't get hit by the magic. And that brings us to the Galda Machine. You're going to wish you had more firepower against this guy. Whenever the boss's hands are flashing, he's about to shoot some fire. You want to be to the left or the right of the boss so that he shoots that fire at a 45 degree angle and doesn't throw it straight downwards because the only time you could damage this guy is when his hands are away from his body, and that's right after he throws the fire. If he drops the fire straight downwards, you won't have much of an opportunity to shoot him, but if he throws it at an angle, you'll be able to slide in and get in some hits. The big complication here, of course, are those three orbs that bounce around the room. You can't destroy those, your number one priority during this fight is going to be avoiding those orbs. And the basic strategy looks like this. You'll hang out on the left or the right side of the screen, whichever one has fewer orbs, and you'll need to bounce between the two sides so that you can stay away from them. Watch for Galda's hands to move, and as soon as he moves those flashing hands, you want to get in front of him and try to get some hits in. If the orbs start to converge on you, move out of the way of the orbs and don't worry about hitting Galda until your next opportunity. Sometimes the orbs will disappear. That doesn't mean that they're gone forever, but this could be a good opportunity to focus on shooting the boss. Just don't be surprised whenever those orbs spawn again from the front of the boss and get hit by them when they come out. What exactly is this boss anyways? Is he riding some sort of hovercraft? Does he have a lower half to his body, or is he just sort of a torso grafted onto the machine? And where did he get this kind of technology in the Paleozoic era? These are questions that we'll probably never find the answers to, so just keep avoiding the orbs, watch the boss's flashing hands for movement, and just keep blasting them until his head explodes. And that's it, we've done it. We've beaten Dragon Spirit the new legend. All we can do now is sit back, relax, and enjoy the cheesy ending. Well, I'm happy to report that this ending makes a lot more sense than the it was all a nightmare ending that you get whenever you beat it with the gold dragon. Light and peace were restored to the earth and a new legend was created so it seems that everything wrapped up nicely. That would close the book on this game, but the developers at Now Production added an easter egg to this ending, but it was removed for the English language version. Other than changing the language from Japanese to English, there are very few other changes to this game, so there's the shirt that was added to the guy in the gold dragon cutscene, and then there's this. Well, I don't think they needed to give that guy a shirt, I totally understand why they took this out of the game. If you press the select button 20 times, it's like an intense gust of wind is blowing this woman's skirt and hair. So I can see why they took that out of the game, but I only mention it because the company that made this, Now Production, made another game called Splatterhouse Wanpaku Graffiti, and in that game there's a lot of other interactive cutscenes that are similar to this one. And that brings us to the final credits. 
There were a lot of shoot 'em up games on the NES, and they're some of the most difficult games on the system. This game is a little bit more forgiving. In a game like Gradius, if you get hit by anything, you're instantly killed, so it's nice to have a life bar. That's not to say that this game is easy, but if you find games like Silver Surfer, Life Force, or Gradius to be very intimidating, this is a good game to start with. If you like this game, there is a sequel called Dragon Saber that was only released for the PC Engine in Japan, but you don't need to be able to read Japanese to be able to play it, and it's a pretty cool game itself. Well, I hope this video was able to help you finally beat Dragon Spirit the New Legend and restore peace to the Paleozoic Era. If it did, make sure to give it a like, and make sure to subscribe for more videos. Because there will always be more evil wizards threatening the eras of the ancient past. And that's why we'll be back again next week with another video game you can beat. Thanks for watching.